Hi, I'm Frances Callier. And I'm Angela V. Shelton. And we're Frangela. You know what you need in your life? Hmm. The Final Word Podcast. Yes, you do. That's right. It is the final word on all things political and pop cultural. Where we make real news real funny. Where we inspire you so you can hashtag resist. Subscribe and get a new episode of The Final Word Podcast each week. It's the news we think you need to hear. That's right. We think you need to hear it. Okay? Yeah, it's what we say so. That's right. And because all we do is give, every Thursday you can listen to our hysterical podcast, Idiot of the Week. We round up the stupid because you know what? Somebody has to. Okay. All we do is give. MSW Media. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Feminist Buzzkills Live, the show that decided our charity for 2021 is pooling our money together to buy Ben Shapiro's wife a G-spot Roomba. We're giving that way. <laughs> I'm Liz Winstead, and with me are my fellow Buzzkills and co-conspirators, Moji Alawadiel and Marie Khan. Marie, we're so happy you're back and you're well. Yay! Thank you. I'm so glad to be joining all of you. And coming up on this show, we thought it might be good to get some tips on how to talk about abortion over the holidays. So we invited Tammy Kramenacher from the only clinic in North Dakota to help us navigate that minefield. And we remember Bell Hooks and the way she changed the feminist narrative. Plus, tis the season. And the incredible Tina Schlieski will be here with a song that I am putting my tits on the line saying it's going to become an instant holiday classic. But first, BS is popping, so let's get right to it. Oh, I got some BS. We're going to talk about the abortion pill. So when the abortion pill was approved in the 90s, it was a path to make abortion accessible and affordable. But the U.S. government decided that they weren't going to let us be great and slap regulations on the pill that made it harder and less acceptable, accessible defeating the whole purpose. Anyway, the FDA is about to decide today, I, I think, whether to remove these regulations. And if it does, it would mean a clearer path to abortion access. So uh, good news for one, kind of. I mean, uh, it's funny when we talk about the abortion pill uh, on our socials, people don't know what it is. Abortion pill is not plan B. It's a two part regimen that stops a pregnancy and then it encourages the body to just expel the products of conception. And we will have a great commercial break a little later in the show that explains how it works, but it's incredibly safe and effective. Um, so like a little more history, it was approved in France in the 1980s and the US dragged its feet on purpose. And then finally in 2003, Clinton was like, why don't we have this again? 93, sorry, in 93, 93, Clinton was like, why don't we have this again? And it continues to stall until the year 2000, uh, when it was finally available in this country, fully available. Fully is a broad term, and it's not actually, that's not true. But the anti-choice political machine is so strong that when it was approved um, in the US, we had to create a whole new, a whole new company to market it. No one would say who uh, own the company. We still don't know who manufactures it for safety concerns because the anti-choice political machine, not political machine, but the level of violence and that was expected was just not worth it. And the company only has one product so that other products aren't boycotted. So it's really kind of weird, but it's exciting that there'll be more access, but also more access is only, it's still only partial. Like right now, what is it? 19 states have active bans on receiving it via telemedicine. Yes. I mean, it just, it's so crazy to me that like, there's this emancipating drug that will make abortion accessible for people who live in rural areas, for people who don't mm -hmm. want to travel. You could have it, you know, in a perfect world, a sane world, a practical world, a compassionate world. <laughs> you could get it through telemedicine. You could get it from your pharmacist. You could get it through the mail, you know, like so much. 
And yet we just garbage it up. And it wasn't until a couple of years ago um, that it was only allowed to be used up until seven weeks. And then the FDA was like, this is fine to 10 weeks. It's fine. We'll do it to 10 weeks. Um, I think they even could do it in Europe, maybe up to 12, but I'm going to ask our guest about that um, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken on that. Um, so I just feel like this could be such a an advancement in a time when we are feeling such reproductive coercion that um, I cannot wait to hear what the FDA does and i cannot wait to find out how that can open up breathing room and space and just bodily autonomy for a bunch of folks who need abortion care i also think a missed opportunity is that um because of the way it's it's been restricted we haven't been able been able to explore the other ways that it could be helpful to people so i think this will really open a lot more opportunities for finding out what else the abortion pill can do for us that's right. And I and I just want to reiterate what Moji said. Watch in our commercial break this we made this very hilarious and very informative video about medication abortion. And if medication abortion is new to you, uh, it's a really good little 101 to understand. And here's something that you should probably understand. It's also used to treat Cushing's, to treat ulcers. It is safer than aspirin. It is safe, safe, safe. And so any regulation on it is political, political, political garbage. And it is just more ways to just keep laws on your bodies that are making the stench of a thousand suns. Um, Marie, speaking of laws that um, yeah. <laughs> rise the stench of a thousand suns, I feel like you've got something coming out of Connecticut that could possibly maybe, it was good news that's turning now into more people wanting to just paw all over your rights. Yeah, it's just, it's what we've talked about, these ongoing challenges to our bodily autonomy. So one of the especially deceitful tactics, Liz, that the forced birth movement uh, likes to employ are their fake clinics, which they refer to as pregnancy resource centers. These places, they impersonate real medical clinics, but they use religious guilt, medically inaccurate information regarding abortion, pregnancy, care in general, and they try to talk people out of abortion. That's their chief mission. Activists have fought against them for years, and last July in the state of Connecticut, they got legislation passed banning the deceptive advertising by fake clinics. They're still allowed to operate, they're still existing, they just don't get to advertise it. And now, one of the largest bullying arms of Christianity, the Alliance Defending Freedom, is suing Connecticut for their right to lie to pregnant people. Oh, it so is. That, that's, that's the situation. <laughs> We can't have a good thing without like just the bulldozers of garbage coming in. No, no. So Marie, for these... folks who don't know, will you tell people, like, again, I just feel like it bears just telling the story and over again. Tell people what these clinics do because it's so creepy. They, Liz, they lie to pregnant people about their pregnancy options. They spread abortion myths. They would refer, they talk about breast cancer and infertility being tried to abortion care, which we know is not true. It's been medically disproven. And they even have non-medical staff at these clinics, these fake clinics who perform medically inaccurate ultrasounds. And with my work with Midwest Access Coalition, I and, and many, many other folks that are at abortion funds and in abortion funding around the, the, um, the country, they've, we've had folks come to us who think they are 10 weeks pregnant, and then they find out they were told an inaccurate ultrasound reading, and now they have to actually travel much farther for abortion care. And that's a tactic I, that these clinics employ, along with saying adoption, adoption is a alternative to, to pregnancy. And we know that is patently, patently false. Well, and when I, I mean, these places have been around forever. When I got, yeah. the first time I got pregnant, um, I got pregnant the first time I ever had sex in high school. And I ended up at one oh. of these places because I saw a poster on a bus that said free pregnancy tests, choices, options. And I went there yeah. thinking that, and the person literally was dressed up in a lab coat. And, you know, you're like, oh, this is a doctor. And then you're like, wait, they wear lab coats at the lawn comb counter at Macy's. So like anybody can get a lab yep. coat, but you know, that's the whole point is that they, they're very good at like crafting language to make you think that they're authorities on yes. care and that they're going to provide care and they don't. And I think that's what this case is about. Right. Moji. 
Yeah, I think that's what it's about. I, um, I want to know, though, like exactly what was this false advertising happening? I mean, was it regular CPC advertising? Was it anything particularly egregious? Or was it Connecticut just being like, it's not right to lie to pregnant people? I mean, I think what it is is falsely saying you're providing medical care, um, yep. listing that you are going to provide care and also leaving things out, I think is crucial. You know, deception mm -hmm. can come in many forms and um, saying that you're going to provide um, abortion counseling um, it says that you're going to hopefully to a, a person of untrained ears, they would assume that you would get counseling on all the aspects of abortion, what kinds of abortion, you know, what that does. And so I think it's things like that, where once you get in, if they say they're going to provide abortion counseling and what they provide is lies about abortion, about like yeah. the, the actual medical lies about abortion and also mental lies about the mental uh, things about abortion. And then that they don't ever recommend it at all. It's those kind of practices that I think the state of Connecticut has said, you can exist all day long if you don't provide medical care but if you're going to deceive people into thinking you're going to be comprehensive in your care that's great and the thing that's really troubling is you know a case, we went to the supreme court uh, a california case called becerra v nifla um nifla a chain of um these fake clinics and becerra the attorney general of california and what the supreme court ruled is that if you are not providing medical care and and apparently it's perfectly legal for any person again just in, in doctor imposter wearing a lab coat to give an ultrasound if you're not doing medical care you can with the first amendment um tell people all kinds of tales as long as you are not dispensing medical care and you're not a licensed facility so the irony is the supreme court said if you're fake you can continue to cosplay someone medical uh care and just tell them all kinds of lies because you're not actually providing the care how fucked up is it's that so fucked so up I, that that's the standard that's right like it's so and fucked these, up i don't know these, hurts my heart fake clinics are also in communities that don't have real clinics at all so they outnumber vastly any options people could go to for for sti care pregnancy care all these types of things that folks are looking for they especially prey on communities that english might not be the primary language they speak communities that um are often targeted by christian groups and evangelical groups to try to save quote unquote so those are the types of folks that that these fake clinics are yeah I think it's true. And they have um, heavy hands and a lot of legal money who are going to bring up that Supreme Court case in this garbage legal. Mar oh. Moji, we have to wrap out of this segment quickly, but can you, um, in sort of 30 seconds, let people know about the Alliance for Defending Freedom? Who are the people Absolutely. who are bringing the suit? The Alliance Defending Freedom, they are uh, terrible. They actually were organized to be the anti-ACLU. They're pretty heavy hitters in the organized hate world. Uh, they are a legal advocacy and training group, and also Southern Poverty Law Center calls them a hate group. Uh, and they oppose abortion rights, they oppose gay rights, they oppose women's rights, and they oppose gay sex, specifically gay sex, uh, also gay rights. Yeah. But they really down into the sex in a way that is a little, like, a, it's appalling. I mean, they like to just talk about it. Yeah, and they're the ones, and they are heavily funded, and they bring cases against um abortion clinics all this stuff all the time and um so we'll see how that plays out and i wonder if it's going to be a challenge to becerra and i wonder if they're going to uphold that precedent you know instead of actual precedent that makes sense for people in autonomy speaking of which um unless you were living in some kind of cave um about a week ago or three days ago, or I don't know, two years ago what time is it what is time i have no idea anymore um the supreme court ruled in part that clinics can sue in Texas, a narrow group of people to fight against this crappy ass bounty law, but they let the law stay in place. So people from around the country can um, create their own set of stalking, people providing care and helping people access care. Uh, and they can pass laws to allow this horrible six week ban to remain in place. Um, and the media has 
really for the first time talked a lot. They've been prognosticating about the legislation, what it means um, in a very like broad sense. But we wanted to talk today a little bit about what this does to people who are providing care. What does it mean for folks and how do you provide care in a time when you are you look at Texas and you are in a perpetual state of lawsuit? You talk to any provider uh, and they'll tell you that it feels very isolating a lot of times when you have to walk through a sea of wretched people outside of your clinic who are working tirelessly in communion with le- with politicians making these laws. Um, and when you don't have a lot of community sp- support, uh, it can feel hard when you feel like your job, you might lose your job because abortion might go away. Um, it's feels, it feels terrifying. And I don't think we center those that provide the care enough because they're people who are having said all that, you know, they're the people who go to work every day because people's lives and dignity and constitutional rights and medical care matter. And I think we need to, as a society and as people who claim to be pro-choice, it's not enough to just lay that out there and think you've done something. I think it's really important to um, proverbially and figuratively and whatever the thing is, um, take these folks in and say, we love that you're in our community. We support that you're in our community and we're going to be there to make sure that your well-being is looked out for. I think that importantly, we spend a lot of time centering patients because we should, um, but for patients, often it's a moment or a few moments in their lives. And for people who work in the industry, that's years and months and years of their life of just like swimming through this trauma daily. And it's it's exhausting. And I think that the for any job, the, the supports we have for self-care are weak, right? Um, and especially for people who work in industries that are not respected. And unfortunately, I feel like people do not respect and love our providers the way that we should. That's and I a think really good too, point. Oh, go ahead, Marie. That's a really good point, Moji, in terms of self-care, like thinking, because Moji and I have had conversations like, I should look and get a therapist. That's hard for an individual like me. Now, can you imagine if my profession is such that, you know, the, the majority of, of people elected in particular states wish me death, you know, where my, my people who have worked with me and been my colleagues have been shot and killed. How, how does that type of person trust someone and seek out self-care in ways? How are they able to, to have the type of, of mental health and support that all of our medical providers should be having? And how can we help facilitate um, those positive outcomes for people, right? Um, because I think that, you know, when you, when you work in care that is consistent and, and you know, it's just like, you are, you're in places, um, if, if there's one or two clinics in your state, um, or you're a place where you are considered a place that someone travels to because abortion is more accessible, you're seeing a bigger caseload. You know, there's not time to stop and care about yourself and even communicate with your colleagues who can understand what you're doing. And I think that, you know, we travel the country a lot with Abortion Access Front and go visit clinics and and facilitate to their needs. And when we talk to folks so often, they they say, we don't get to know each other. We don't have time because we are working from start to finish. A lot of times with the onslaught of the hate that is out there, you know, folks have to drive home from work a different way each time. Um, if they live in a community where it, that's hostile um, towards abortion legislatively, or it's a m- more conservative community, um, they can't get somebody to be their lawn care service or, you know, paint their, paint their clinic or do that kind of stuff. And so um, we try to help connect community with the clinics and their needs. And it's been really rewarding and really helpful. And, and I know we have to wrap, but I just remember being in Oklahoma um, and having a guy listening to the stories as we were talking to the um, Oklahoma clinic and, and he's had his hand up and he was very, very patient. And I said, you have a question. And he said, yeah, I I just want to know if I understand you correctly. You're telling me that a form of activism is my landscaping company taking on this clinic as a client and they pay me 
And that's activism. And I said, yes, for you to park your van in front of that clinic and say, I want to make this clinic look beautiful. I love having this clinic in my community and I am very proud to have them as a client. That's a giant form of activism and it's something that we all can do. And um, it's something that we all need to really think about. And I think that a I want to continue this conversation, not about clinics, but with somebody who um, we just love, who is a provider in North Dakota, Marie. Yes, we are so excited to have joining with us, Tammy Kronemacher, director and owner of the Red River Women's Clinic, the only clinic in the state of South Dakota, excuse me, the only clinic in the state of North Dakota providing abortion care. Tammy is here to share some of her own experiences about talking abortion with her family and the toll this political climate takes on her staff. <coughs> That's right. Hi, Tammy. Tammy. Hi, me. Hi, Marie. Hi. How are you? Good to see you? Well, it's cold here in North Dakota, but I'm pretty good. I know. I'm in Minnesota. I feel you. We are we are living our freezing cold truth, but we have our good hats that we're going to show at the end. Um, that Yay. you have made that we want many people to buy. Um, but before before we get into this talking about abortion over the holidays and sort of like what it's like to provide in this political climate, um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about as we are awaiting this uh, FDA ruling to um, take the restrictions off medication abortion, um, what that would mean for a clinic like yours that is one clinic in a very rural state, like how would that be a game changer? Well, unfortunately, it's not going to change anything for us because our very restrictive legislature set out uh, many years ago to restrict any sort of telemedicine um, use of medication abortion. You know, at the same time, they were promoting telemedicine because of our very rural state and with uh, the COVID pandemic, you know, they've really pushed it and thrown some money at that, but of course, carved out medication abortion in our state. So they said the physician has to physically be in the same room with the patient anytime an abortion inducing drug is dispensed. So no matter what the FDA does, North Dakota already was like, nope, got to make it really hard for people. So even if the FDA removes it from this list of um, medications that have to be administered by a doctor, um, there's workarounds by the state to just keep it in, in a place where it's not accessible. And it's not only, you know, I know a lot of other states, you know, um, mid-level practitioners like a nurse or a PA, you know, dispense it. Again, North Dakota said only a licensed physician dispense medication abortion. And again, in the same physical room with the patient. So, no. Oh my gosh. That is so disheartening. Yeah, we, we were talking yeah, I mean, earlier about Go on. I was just going to, we have patients who travel to us sometimes four, five, six hours one way just to get the, you know, medication abortion. So greatly, you know, affect them and their ability to have, you know, not have to drive, especially in the winter, um, you know, just to get to our clinic. But no matter what the politicians were way ahead of the game in making it restrictive. So Tammy, I just want to ask one question, Marie, before we pivot over to um, the conversations around abortion. Is no, are you saying to me in North Dakota, you can't take the second dose of this pill on your own in your home? No, you can. For a short while there between when the FDA, before they updated their label, that was in fact true. Patients had to return to the clinic to take the misoprostol. And so we had patients, again, you know, taking it right before they hopped in their car and were driving five hours you know, having to stop at like a rest stop because the medic started working. So for about six months, that was the case. But then when the label was updated, um, the misoprostol can be given and they can take it home and take it when they want to take it. Um, so it's just the first pill, mifepristone, has to, to be dispensed in the same physical physician. Which seems so, I mean, if you're listening at home and saying, why is one pill safe and the other one isn't? Um, you wouldn't be alone in wanting to smash your head against your computer in the hypocrisy of that. But I, I don't even know what, to, <laughs> I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. 
Um, I mean, that's, all right. it's kind of on par for, for the course, though, like what we're seeing in your state um, at large. Tammy, we were talking earlier about the toll providing abortion care is taken on clinic staff during this time, this time being COVID, this time being the holidays. And you have a state with one clinic, a 24-hour waiting period, a trigger ban, abortion insurance riders that are available for extra purchase. So if the Supreme Court dissolves Roe, like what... What does that mean for you all? And how do these barriers and the instability, what is that, how does that manifest for your, pay, your, your staff and your patients? Well, North Dakota is again, um, one of those lovely states where they passed a trigger ban many years ago. And it was sort of vague at the time, um, but then we have this one very anti-abortion uh, state uh, senator and she wanted to clean it up make it much clearer so in the last legislative session they changed it so that it was very clear if roe were to fall north dakota would ban abortion within 30 days so i don't know what they think you know it's going to happen in those 30 days um but basically abortion would be illegal in our state within 30 days if roe falls so obviously that's a huge weight um you know on my shoulders not only do i feel like you know, we got to keep our clinic open, keep abortion access available for people. You know, the next closest clinics in the Minneapolis area are, you know, a four hour drive. And that means everything is easy. It's, you know, my doctor couldn't even get home last night. Um, she had, she drives from the Minneapolis area. She had to stop. You know, literally wasn't safe for her to make all the way home. Um, so, you know, we're obviously concerned about that. We're thinking about it. We're trying to make plans. You know, do we just hop over the river into Moorhead, Minnesota? Because Minnesota is a more, um, you know, they call it a haven state. Um, you know, but that takes a lot of effort. Just like you were talking about the landscaping guy, who are we going to find that's either going to rent to us or sell to us? Um, they might be hostile. Um, there's just not a lot of options over there. Um, it's too late in the year to build. You don't get to build um, brand new facilities in the middle of the winter in our part of the country. So we're we're trying to figure out what do we do. Um, and of course, I want to stay optimistic and think that, you know, they're going to bring the, you know, uh, limit down, but not overtly overturn Roe v. Wade so we can stay open. But then there's going to be another state that's going to bring another, you know, viability new line that they're going to try and bring. So it's it just feels like it's so fraught right now. Um, and I don't want to give up on North Dakota. You know, sure. Yeah, let me hop over the river into Minnesota. That seems like, oh, why don't you just head over? I mean, I can walk out the front door of the clinic in Minnesota. Is, I can see it. I feel like Sarah Palin when I say that. I can see <laughs> Minnesota from the front door of the clinic. But, uh, you know, it is right there. But I, I am not going to leave North Dakota unless I absolutely have to. And I think that's the point is that you shouldn't have to. And I get really angry with people who are like, why don't people just move? Why don't blah, 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 blah. You know, you, you're committed to your folks and you're committed to your state and, you know, it shouldn't have to be this way. And, you know, when we talk a lot about, you know, the pressure that's on the clinic staff and what, and, and what they're doing and how they care. And, you know, that just, um, it bleeds over in a, into our everyday life. And um, we really want to talk to you, Tammy, especially Marie and I, because I come from a super conservative family in Minnesota. Marie comes from a super conservative family in Wisconsin. Um, and talking about abortion over the holidays, um, it's like, I just feel like it's important to talk about it when you can and if you can. And so, and sometimes you can't, but it, I look at this sort of anti-racism model of if we just run away from it all the time, then we don't break barriers. And so I wondered how you navigate it yourself, if you have any tips on how to talk with your own relatives about abortion, um, especially now that A, it's in the news and it's unavoidable, and B, it's what you do. How do you navigate that, those conversations? Well, you know, for a long time, I mean, obviously my parents know what I, um, they do not approve um, of what I do. They've sent me a, you know, note that basically says as practicing Catholics, you know, we don't approve of abortion, but you seem to be doing well. 
um, in your chosen field. And we're proud of that. Um, so with them, I have to just completely not talk about it. It's such a huge part of my identity. Um, you know, thank goodness I have a daughter to talk about because otherwise I don't know what I would talk to them about. Um, and then for a long time, you know, the stigma and, and shame of abortion really, um, you know, was kind of prevalent and I wasn't sure. I didn't know what my parents told other family members. What did I have to protect mom and dad? You know, what do they tell their friends? Um, and so, you know, I found out later that um, basically my entire family knew, <laughs> you know, as soon as you start talking about it, you figure out that everybody knows what you do. Um, and folks have told me, um, you know, they're just worried about my safety. Um, I found out, you know, my uncle, my dad's brother, um, they had a friend who had an abortion. And so for them, it was personal. And, and they, they actually connected me with the friend and she wrote me this really kind letter. I think she, I think she had an abortion, you know, maybe, maybe it was even a pre row abortion, but you know, that was an outlet. Um, and so I know they, I don't know, I don't want to say approve, but they're not hostile. Um, and the funniest thing that happened one time is we were at a family function. It was actually a funeral and it was with my cousins who are super redneck, you know, hunting law enforcement, you know, all this stuff. And it was right after I was on Rachel Maddow and he said something like, yeah, I tried to watch, but I just, I don't like that short haired lady. Um, so, you know, but, but good job. You did, you did well. And I was like, okay. And then his brother was like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? And I really talk about his wife is um, like the, you know, youth church, every Facebook post is Jesus, this and God, God that's like, oh God, here we go. So um, of course we were day drinking because we're burying our like 45 year old cousin, which sucked. Um, so we go to that station and, and he's like, what, you know, what are you talking about? Tell me about this. And I said, okay, Rob, well, you know, I run the only abortion clinic in the state of Dakota, and that's, you know, that's what we're talking about. He said, oh, oh, that's fine. You know, even in our church, like if the pastor's gay, like they got to be out, like, you know, we make them be out. I was like, oh, okay. I was really worried about you and your wife, but he was like, no, 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 it's all good. So, you know, I learned with that too. Like you, we also can't make assumptions that people are, are going to be against us based on, you know, if they're Christian or not. So it is what it is now. Um, and I haven't had, you know, the nice thing is my two sisters, um, they actually might be more feminist than I am. Um, and they're super supportive. Um, so, you know, I just, I've learned to not go to my parents' house, maybe right after a conference, especially like, you know, Liz an abortion care network conference, which you just feel so fired up and wonderful about. Cause I did that once and it was the worst because I had to just, you know, not talk about the coolest week I just had with a bunch of abortion people. Um, so that that's how it's gone for me. I'm, I'm glad that you have those, those family, like, I, I can't imagine that with having a parent in that type of exchange with you, but at least the fact that you have siblings and I really, I like you referencing like talking to other folks and not making assumptions. Like I grew up in the same very much Wisconsin hunting community, everything. And, and it's been interesting talking with relatives and actually opening up outside of the older generations, like the current elders of the family. It's very interesting to hear what people can, what people maybe feel more empowered to stay. So we wanted, Tammy, thank you so much for joining us. We wanted to know how we can help uh, bring you all the support and comfort you need. I am wearing one of the hats that your awesome abortion fund, Women in Need, North Dakota, um, is repping right now. Very Midwestern. Um, but we'd like I to know how can I just bought eight we... of them. I just bought eight of them. <laughs> Yay. How can we support River Women's Clinic and, and the D Dakota Abortion Fund? So Red River Women's Clinic, I mean, it's always good. Support your local clinic. Send them a postcard. Don't send them mail. We get freaked out by letters, but send us a postcard. Um, and honestly, the best thing to do with for our clinic is to support the North Dakota Women in Need Abortion Access Fund. Um, the abortion, you betcha, um, you make a suggested donation. It goes directly to the patients. Helps the clinic. You know, if our patients can be seen here, it helps us. Um, you know, chocolate is always good. It's just the easy stuff or supporting right now our escorts. Um, they need hand warmers and foot warmers cause they're standing outside when it's 
20, 30 degrees below and the protesters, they're out there too. So um, any support that way. But yeah, the abortion you betcha hats are great. Um, we've just had to print a whole bunch more. Thank you, Liz. You really have been repping them um, and they've been selling like hotcakes. So go Yay. check it out. Um, ndwinfund.org. Um, Tammy, thank you so much. I also want to say that you, I guarantee you that you are going to be getting a massive supply of hand warmers from Abortion Access Front. We got you on that um, and all sorts of goodies. Um, thank you for all you do. Thank you for repping the uh, upper Midwest and being so incredible. Um, and uh, folks, it's super important that you do that. We have a resources page where you can go adopt a clinic and we're gonna plug that again at the end of the show. But if you go to aafront.org slash resources, uh, we have ways that you can sign up and adopt a clinic. There's lists up there where, cl where clinics put their needs and you can help them out. Tammy, we're here for you. We love you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my God. Coming up, Tina Schlieski, the amazing Tina Schlieski makes your holiday experience that much brighter and it's free. Plus, we're going to take some time later in the show to honor bell hooks. But first... A few words from our sponsors, and by a few, I mean zero, because that pro-abortion give-no-fucks car company or boner pill manufacturer has not yet taken out an ad on our show. But the good news for you, our fake commercials are highly entertaining. Back in a minute. Unintended pregnancy affects everything. Oh, God. Your job, your finances, your future. No shit. This is way more than I can deal with right now. If it's not the right time for you to be pregnant, it's so not. Then it's time to take your life back with medication abortion. Yes. Wait, what? Medication abortion. Pills you can take at home or in a clinic. Who the F are you? And where the F are I'm you? I'm not in a stall. I'm the generic voice from every pharmaceutical ad. That's a relief. You could have been a stalker or a Russian hacker. Wait, did you say I could take the abortion pill at home? Yes. Check with your doctor or clinic to ask if the abortion pill is right for you. Okay. First, I'm going to check with my therapist about why I'm hearing voices. Got an appointment ran late. So, do you know what you're going to do? Yeah, I'm gonna take the abortion pill. Well, how does it work? It's pretty straightforward. Um, Here's how the abortion pill works. You heard that right? Yeah. Medication abortion or the abortion pill is a combination of two drugs that you can take up to 10 weeks of pregnancy. Mifepristone, which blocks the hormone required to sustain a pregnancy, and misoprostol, which starts the contractions to expel the pregnancy tissue, resulting in abortion. Taken together as directed, they are 99% effective at ending a pregnancy. That was basically what I was going to say, except maybe less advertising. Huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, my doctor says it'll only take about 24 hours. There'll be some bleeding and cramps, but I can do it at home, and I can even go back to work the next day. And it don't is... forget, the abortion pill is extremely safe. Yeah, I was getting to that. In fact, having an abortion with pills is safer than a colonoscopy. Mm -hmm. And complications occur far less than 1% of the time. And over 3 million women in the U.S. have used the abortion pill. How do you guys know so much about this? Oh, I heard the voice when I was hiking by a stream the other day. And that voice followed me after art class to yoga in the park. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks to this creepy yet informative voice, we all know a little bit more about the advantages of the abortion pill. So ask your healthcare provider if the abortion pill is right for you. Then ask politicians to stop legislating what is right for you. Yes. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> to find out more about the abortion pill, go to howtoyouseabortionpill.org. There are risks associated with expanding access to the abortion pill, including, but not limited to, a sharp increase of women taking control of their own destinies, which could cause permanent damage to the current political system. Prolonged use of politics to block abortion access has resulted in loss of rights, a wage gap, and overall inequality. You there! Me? Yes, 
you. What day is it? Do we still have Rogie Wee as law of the land? Barely hanging on by a thread, but yeah. That's wonderful. I need you to do something for me. I need you to take this large bag of money and donate it to the abortion access front. And save a little for yourself in case you ever need an abortion. Go! Oh! Gee, thanks! Off with you now. Well, what are you waiting for? Head over to Abortion Access Front and make a donation. Do it. Click. Or do whatever it is they do to give money in the 21st century. Hello. Yesterday? Hello. Uh, yesterday, we were saddened to learn of the death of Bell Hooks at 69. We'll be doing a deeper dive in next week's show about her life, her work, and how she chased, changed the face of feminism as a Black woman for all women. But first, I wanted to hear from y'all about Bell Hooks and what she meant to the movement. Marie? I mean, now more than ever, we really need to revisit her work from 2000, Feminism for, is for Everybody. Like that, we, we need to look at that and we need to ask ourselves, this world we're in right now, white feminism in this world, like what is what are we doing? Where are we going forward? Yeah, and I think the thing about Bell Hooks is um, the constant smashing of the patriarchy and the constant, she stayed in a movement that even when white feminism was centering itself, she stayed in to push back so that she could get new voices and make sure that the experiences of black and brown women we're honored and um, I can't wait to talk more about her work um, next week. So rest in power, Bell Hooks. Thank you for everything you do. And Bell Hooks was nothing if not a destroyer of systems of oppression. And so it's more prescient than ever that we have the wonderful Tina Schlieski to sing a little holiday carol about that exact topic. Take it away, Tina. Thank you, Tina. That is my new favorite, favorite Christmas Carol. Tina will be performing in Austin, Texas on the 18th of December at the Continental and at the Dakota in Minneapolis on January 15th doing her Sinatra to Simone Jazz show. It's incredible. And uh, before we wrap up and thank everybody, oh my God, we have breaking news. Um, the FDA has removed the restrictions we were talking about. So the restriction that was in place 
that the abortion pill had to be restricted to be only uh, dispersed in doctor's offices is gone. The new regulations is that mifepristone could be, can be prescribed under the supervision of a certified healthcare provider. So not just doctors, but certified healthcare providers. Uh, and a health care provider must obtain a signed patient agreement form from the patient after counseling. And pharmacies can now start dispensing mifepristone, but they must be certified. So this is great news. Pharmacists can now dispense. Yeah. Uh, licensed uh, medical people uh, who are qualified, not just doctors can dispense. And you can do it not just in a doctor's office. So this is all really good news. And we'll be talking more about this and what it means for um, access to abortion, expansion of abortion, and how the creepy people are going to try to um, squash that too. But so we learned a bunch on the show today. Uh, uh, Marie, Moji, where do we want to go? Teachable moments. Marie, what do you oh. got? I think that Dr. Imposter would be a great name for an anti-abortion Marvel villain. Oh, that's a, that, was a, that was a good takeaway. <laughs> Moj? I learned that replacing real clinics with fake clinics is like replacing Aunt Viv on, fresh, on the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and expecting no one to notice. We notice. <laughs> I didn't learn this, but I do appreciate it that... Um, Minnesota is a lot easier to see from your house than Russia is if your house is in Alaska. So there you go. <laughs> and I just do like doing my accent whenever I can. Um, yeah. Well, that's the show, friends. Thanks again to Tammy and Tina for joining us and to you for watching. That's right. Join us next week when comedian Gina Yashere stops by to talk about her newly released memoir, Cack Handed. Plus, these three little buzzkills will be exchanging our holiday gifts live on the show. Plus, we care so deeply about the health and well-being of every person working at clinics that we're continuing our annual holiday Adopt a Clinic drive. And you can help support clinics and fulfill their wish lists. All the details are online at aafront.org slash resources. And finally this week, here's the anti-abortion white walker who never does a half-assed job of showing his whole ass. So we have over 1.5 million children incarcerated in frozen prisons without due process right now. It grows by 18% every year. 5% of them are donated to science genetic research where they are thought out, tortured and killed to death for research. There's no ethical way to deal with IVF without incarcerating children without due process. Feminist Buzzkills Live is a production of Abortion Access Front. Subscribe to our YouTube at aafront.org slash fbksub.